to start. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you spending your Saturday morning with us. We're going to have one hour filled with lots of information, and um, I hope you have your coffee this morning. All righty. So I am Misty Castillo, and I am with the International Dyslexia Association Arizona branch, and I am super proud to be here with um, Becky and Susan today, and I'll give a, an introduction to them in just a minute. Um, I want to go over some housekeeping. We are doing Zoom webinar, which is a little bit different than the regular Zoom, and so it's mainly focusing in on the um, participants so that we don't have so many um, little faces on. It's just going to zoom right into the speakers for today. You will see at the bottom that you have a Q&A box and a chat box. Um, you can go ahead and utilize the chat box throughout the presentation, and then towards the end, we're going to utilize the Q&A box to um, ask questions specifically to Susan and to Becky. Um, we are going to begin with the welcome and introductions, and then we are going to have structured literacy overview provided by Susan, and then we're going to have a real brief Q&A coffee chat with, um, with all of us. And then we'll have a wrap up. And I want to make sure that you stay till the end because we have a couple of surprises for you at the end. So stay till the end. So now for the introductions of the people you've been waiting for. Becky, I am super honored to introduce to you one of my dear friends, Becky Rapier. Becky is a teacher with decades of teaching, coaching, and administrative experience. She has worked with several Arizona school districts and the Department of Education to improve reading and writing instruction. And recently, she has joined 95% Group to continue working with teachers, schools, and districts on improving student literacy skills. Dr. Susan Hall is founder and CEO of an educational company called 95% Group. The company's mission is to help teachers and administrators identify and address the needs of struggling readers. 95% Group provides professional development, diagnostic assessments, and instructional materials so teachers have the knowledge base and tools to improve outcomes for struggling readers. Let's give Dr. Hall a coffee cheer as she begins to share her gift of knowledge on the topic of structured literacy. All right, thank you so much, Misty, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. So can you see um, the slides? Yes, thank you. Okay, good, now I'm gonna to go to full slide version. So let's do this. Uh, there, so that should be full slide, does that look? Like full slide? Beautiful, that's perfect. All right, good. Love it when the technology works. Well, first of all, thank you, Misty, and colleagues for inviting uh, Becky and myself to join you this morning. We're very excited. Um, I have to tell you, I have a very sweet, dear spot in my heart for the International Dyslexia Association. And I've been an active member for uh, about 22 to 25 years. <clears throat> and the reason that I know about the International Dyslexia Association is because of this little guy who's on the screen right now. This is my son who's now 33, but that's a picture when he was six. And that's about when we started to suspect that there must be something holding him back in reading and we just couldn't quite figure it out. His teacher was perplexed. Um, it turns out he is dyslexic and um, he is the reason that I do this work. I like to put his picture up because I like to share openly that I have lived and walked this journey as a parent, as an educator. Um, and the reason that my whole entire career in education has structured on the struggling readers is because I have seen it up close and personal and watched um, what it took for my little guy to learn to read. He did learn to read and he is um, doing very well. He's an architect, so life is good for him. We were very blessed. We had a lot of good information and that information actually came from the Illinois branch of the International Dyslexia Association and all of the contacts and people I met through that. So I am eternally grateful for what they did to help me to help my son. And for that reason, I will do anything for IDA always um, because I have so much to give back because they helped me. Um, so when I was asked by Misty if I would speak a little bit, we decided that it would be great if I could talk about structured literacy. And so what I'd like to share with you is this beautiful infographic and um, this is straight out of IDA. The International Dyslexia Association has this on their website. I hope you'll go and look for it. Um, 
if you just type in structured literacy, you'll find your way to it. There's also a two page paper that is called just the facts. It's literally very streamlined. It's very just two pages long and it describes much of what I'm going to go into a little bit here. But this infographic shows it has an outer circle, as you can see, and then it, in the interior part, it has those puzzle pieces. So the outside part of that is how one um, how one should teach and the inside is what we should be teaching. So the how and the what are combined beautifully in this infographic and one thing that IDA makes very clear is that structured literacy explicitly teaches these decoding strategies and it will benefit most meaning almost all children but it's absolutely vital or essential for um, our students with dyslexia. All right so this is just taking the inside part now of that um, infographic. Actually, sorry, this is the outside part. So these are the principles that should guide how we teach. We should teach systematic and cumulatively. We absolutely need to be teaching explicitly. It's much more effective and works much better with students who are struggling and learning to read and diagnostically. And so I'd like to take a moment to describe what those words mean. So these are the four terms that we'll highlight that are part of that infographic. So um, I'd like to talk about them by being very concrete. What does it really mean? So explicit, and this is an example from a phonics lesson. This is how it would sound if you are teaching in a manner that is explicit. So imagine for a moment that you're teaching the lesson on uh, long vowel silent um, I and um, long, sorry, long I silent E. And this is what you might hear a teacher who's teaching explicitly say. Today, we're learning to read and spell words with the long vowel silent E pattern. Long vowel silent E words have a single vowel, a single consonant, an E at the end, and the vowel sound is long. There is one, there's only one vowel sound in the word. It takes two vowel letters though to spell it, a single I plus a silent E. The silent E is not pronounced. For those of us who teach, that pretty much sums up like everything you gotta say. You know, that is telling the student what we say is explicitly, we're just telling them everything they've got to know, there's no guessing. Systematic, systematic means that you're doing something in a very systematic way, and there's two words that are often interpreted kind of the same, systematic and sequential, and I think of systematic like this. So imagine in the middle of instruction, you're working with a student, and this is a word chain, where you're saying, okay, that you've already modeled one, now the child, you're saying, let's do this one together, I'll answer with you, we'll start with the word Tim, how do you spell Tim? T. I am. Now change Tim to time. Listen to these two questions. Which sound has changed? What's the new sound? So it's always, you know, what's changing and then how do we spell it? And if you use that same approach and ask those same words, you're being very systematic in how you're teaching. Cumulative. What do we mean by cumulative? Cumulative requires a predetermined sequence. It can't be cumulative if you don't know, I'm covering all of the short vowels first, then I'm going to teach the consonant blends, then I'm gonna teach the consonant digraphs, and then I'm gonna to go to silent E. You have to know and have an order, and literally you're, you're um, building that knowledge base. We also like to repeat and review what's previously been taught. So another way to display this would be like this. You can display it in a list or you can display it in like a stair step like this, but you want to look for, if somebody says that they're teaching in a sequential way and if they're teaching in a cumulative way, they're gonna have to be able to tell you what their sequence is. Otherwise, it can't really be those things. And the last term is diagnostic. And this is an example of how specific we would be um, when we're diagnosing, and that is that you'd ask students to read, and these are 10 nonsense words, and then 10 real words in um, two sentences, all of which have consonant blends in them. And if you're being very diagnostic, you're paying a lot of attention to exactly what the student is missing, making sure that you're figuring out, is it really the blend they're missing, or are they missing the vowel? And so you're really recording it and keeping track of it. And then you're using that information to hopefully prepare groups. Um, to prepare small groups or to be informed about uh, what the student who is getting one-on-one -on -one instructions is ready for, what they've mastered, and what comes next um, that needs to be taught. So I want to spend just a couple more minutes exploring those terms with phonics lessons. 
I think of this as a, a, a graphic that would show you, you know, what are the steps of a good effective phonics lesson? So what does it look like? Well, often we like to start with a review, which is brief. It's something that's been previously taught. It's a warmer upper, but it's typically chosen to be something that is beneficial for what you're about ready to teach. So I'll show you in a minute each of these steps a little bit more, but the review comes first. Something you've previously taught or it's phonological awareness, something that's essential for learning phonics. Then you're teaching the concept. So that's where you're going to introduce it, you're going to teach it as a pattern, you're going to compare and contrast it with words that have that pattern, that don't have that pattern. And then everything in that middle column are things that you do in a phonics lesson that are all about practicing the phonics concept. So you're going to develop word reading accuracy. You also need word reading fluency. The student needs to be doing some word building and orthographic mapping and word chains and sound spelling mapping and then sentence dictation. All of those things are practicing that pattern that's the concept that's being taught in that lesson. And finally, definitely important, is transferring the knowledge of that one pattern in the word level, in a phrase level, and getting it to transfer into connected text. Um, we believe in decodable uh, readers or decodable text being critical when you're talking about a student who needs support in learning to read. So what does that review look like? If it's phonological awareness, it could be a phoneme substitution activity where at the beginning you just do like a one or two minute kind of wake up oral. Um, I'm going to say a word or if you're going to use manipulatives, you can use colored manipulatives and you might say, I'm going to say a word. The word is mug. Now let's change the m mm to m. What's the new word? Mug. And this is just a way of getting their brain going, getting that the manipulating phonemes in, in words activated then this is where you're teaching the new concept. So we believe that orthographic mapping is perhaps one of the most important things that we can do, um, that we can try to engage that orthographic mapping brain process in trying to learn to read with a very explicit way. So this happens to be a quote from David Kilpatrick's book, a really great book. Um, there's a reference there, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties. And he's describing orthographic mapping as the mental process used to store words for immediate effortless retrieval. It's the mechanism for learning new sight words and it requires these things, really good phonemic awareness, um, letter sound knowledge, and the understanding of the alphabetic principle. So one of the things that I think is very important in phonics is to think about phonics as a pattern. We can't teach a child every word. We're not teaching word by word. We're teaching them to be able to examine a word and identify a pattern and use that pattern knowledge to be able to be more effective at learning that word. So this is something that I often use in a workshop. I'll put this up and I'll say, okay, look at this. Which one of those, and I ask people to vote. I have them raise their hand. Which one of those is the one that you can see the pattern the best? And nearly always number four wins. And the second one is generally number one. And I say, well, why is that? Well, because I can see the pattern better when you have those colors there for me. And so that is something that really helps students to learn a pattern. And you can use any colors you want, but I do recommend that you select a color to associate it with different kinds of sounds and words, but keep to the same one, same color. Don't mix the colors up. So whatever colors you want to use, we chose blue for consonants, uh, orange for consonant digraphs, red for short vowels, green for long vowels, but we're going to use this to be able to help the child uh, see that pattern more clearly. So this is a really common approach used, which, the, which um, does inspire that phoneme graphing mapping, that orthographic mapping mental process. So you would say the word, finger stretch the sounds, count the sounds, and identify the number of boxes, sound boxes you're going to use. So if the word is wig, we're going to finger stretch it, wuh, eh, guh, count them, three, we need three boxes. Okay, we're going to use three boxes for this word. And uh, which, which sound kind should I pull down? The first sound is wuh. It's a consonant. Oh, yeah, I'm going to pull down a blue. The second sound is eh. It's a, it's a vowel. I need that red chip. And the last sound, oh, but the red chip went to the wrong place. <laughs> That's so strange. And the last sound is g, and it should be where that red chip is. Uh, but it went to the wrong place, too. So those two should be, should be reversed just never know with technology. So if you've pulled down the blue, red, blue for consonant, vowel, consonant, now I would say to the students, okay, what letter spells the w sound? 
W. What letter spells the I sound? I. What letter spells the G sound? G. So this would be the kind of explicit teaching that you want to see going on for students who are struggling in any way. This is good instruction for all students. They all benefit from this. So a couple of other attributes, um, and I'll just finish like you might be thinking, well, what do you do when you have a digraph? Of course, we have to put digraphs in the same box because it's two letters to spell one sound. So um, the SH in the word ship belongs in one box. And when they write it, we want them to write it that way. So these are not letter boxes. These are sound boxes. And we're going to pair the letters to the sounds. And then we've got this long vowel silent E. Interesting concept that we need to, to let students understand. So the word lake, L, A. We have that long A sound in the middle, but it also takes two letters to spell it, but they're not in the same box. That silent E is after the consonant. So this is just a way to very graphically, explicitly with manipulatives show a student that that long A sound needs two letters, just like that digraph SH needed two letters. So when they write the word, when they're first learning this concept of long, um, long vowel silent E, we like them to actually draw the, um, connect the E and the A, and then we teach them a gesture. They do this, um, a V gesture, so that when you're talking about words, they're literally holding up their hand. Does this have a closed syllable or is this a silent E syllable? Again, trying to get some multisensory um, approach in there to help some students who really benefit from that. So I want to talk about word sorting because I talked about all those things we do in the middle of a phonics lesson to, to practice the pattern. And word sorting is one of the most important. And we would want to see this happening in a good phonics lesson that meets the IDA um, description of structured literacy. So for example, if you present this word to a student and you want them to see if this is a silent E word, you want them to use their gesture. But then if you want them to contrast it, we, we need to see that pin is a closed syllable word with the short I sound and pine is a, is a um, silent E word with the long I sound. And so you want them to sort words under columns so that they're seeing that pattern of how we write the words. It's not just hearing the sounds, but it's associating those letters. So a lot of practice sorting words and then practice reading words, and then finally, um, trying to do to get to a point of some fluency after accuracy. And we believe that fluency should be developed all the way along, not just when students get to that decodable or authentic text at the end of the lesson or the end of learning about it. So we like to develop fluency at the word, the short phrase, the longer phrase, the sentence, and then the passage level. So we think about fluency all the way along. And we actually would recommend that you, you, you would have as part of structured literacy some time devoted to this kind of fluency building. Fluency at the word level, as you can see, fluency at the phrase level. And you can time students to see if they, in fact, are getting to a point where they read those words um, more quickly. Then when you get to multisyllable, you can do some of the same techniques that make it really explicit and that make it very multisensory. You can use um, hand gestures. So if you put up this nonsense word and you're having the students process it, so you would teach them, you know, find the vowels, look between them, how many consonants, where do I divide? In this case, between the M and the D. Let's look at the first consonant only or first syllable only. What type is it? Closed. How do I pronounce that middle I sound? How do I say it? Sim. Now the next one. What type of syllable? Closed. Pronounce the vowel? Ah. Put it together? Dap. Now the whole word? Sim dap. Yes, we are using, um, in this case, uh, nonsense words. You're going to use mostly real words a lot of times in instruction. We certainly use nonsense words when we assess. But every once in a while, when you're presenting, especially if you're presenting to um, a group of students, this is a great way to tell who's really understanding the concept and has never seen it. If I put up a real word, picnic, I don't know who already knew that word. And they're doing it and reading it fine because they knew it already, versus who understands that pattern. Word building is another part, and that's where you want students using their writing. So here's uh, where we would dictate, okay, write the word hid, now write, or sorry, write the word hide, now write hid. So how would I change hid to rid? How would I change rid to ride? Now change that to side. Now change it to sid. So again, you're doing a word chain um, where you're dictating the words and the students are writing it. And again, that's another 
demonstration of a word chain. Sentence dictation is another explicit um, approach that you can use for structured literacy. And that would be where you dictate a sentence. So again, if this is our long I silent E lesson, you might dictate slim likes to ride bikes. Repeat it. Everybody get your whiteboards, write it, show it to me. Now I want you to dot, I want you to look at mine and put a dot under everything that's correct on yours. So again, you're making, um, you're building up and using that reading and writing connection in order to help make this, make that pattern um, more memorable. And then finally, last but not least, is that whole transfer to text process. And that's the process where we are taking it to longer steps. We could start by highlighting just the skill words, then reading only those pat pattern words, then reading the passage without it, and then finally reading um, the text. And so we do want decodable text for that. And it might look like this or a bigger picture of it where those are the words that follow the I silent E. All right, so just to review, the IDA definition for structured literacy talks about how to teach and what to teach. And we talked in depth and showed some examples of explicit, systematic, sequential, and diagnostic. So with that, I'll turn it to Misty. Thank you, Dr. Hall, for your presentation on structured literacy. At this time, we would like to invite the participants to ask questions via the Q&A feature. So while you um, think about your questions and type that in the Q&A, we actually asked the board um, to type up some questions in advance so that um, we can give you guys some think time, but keep this going. So one of the first questions that we have from the board is, what does structured literacy look like in a classroom? So who, who wants to jump in and take that? Missy, do you wanna, do you wanna take that one too? Do you, or do you want, who do you want to, who wants to jump in? Becky, do you wanna jump in? I'm, I'm fine to jump in. I think Susan did a really good job of illustrating what it would look like in a classroom. So we see the teacher kind of taking the lead and doing the teaching and showing and giving the examples. And then they work together. And then, um, then the student um, eventually does it independently. So it's kind of that I do, we do, you do um, scaffolding. And also the explicitness of the teacher is showing and modeling and then the students um, giving the students information and then we acquire the knowledge and then we work on fluency so we always get to that accuracy we get to accuracy but we also get to that um, fluency that automaticity piece as well and i think that really it shows how important not just what we teach but how we are teaching it really impacts student learning so that was great great point here is another one for you. Um, any thoughts on reading programs like Lucy Calkins and how to get your school to shift their thinking in terms of the importance of structured literacy? That is a great question. I'll be happy to jump in and then somebody else can jump in after me. So Heather, I see that this is from Heather. Heather, thank you for asking that question. And I know that Lucy Calkins um, uh, Units of study has become very popular across the United States, as has Fontas and Pinnell. And I think that anyone who really um, has studied IDA's definition of structured literacy would realize that those particular two programs don't actually align with structured literacy in many respects. And so if you have a student who is reading easily, they might do just fine with those programs. If you have a student who is not reading easily and doesn't come to the reading process with the same gifts that some of our children do, then, and especially those like my son and many of you here are here because of our children who are struggling with reading and who are known to be dyslexic, it would be very hard to learn to read. Um, in a program that doesn't have the kind of structured literacy explicitness that we're demonstrating. And what's really missing is that um, explicit, systematic, cumulative sequential teaching. So what's missing in Lucy Calkins program in terms of um, the way phonics is done, and there is some phonics, is it's not done to the degree. Like if you looked at that definition of the long I silent E at the front, 
that is not the way you would see it in um, a program that's like Lucy Calkins program. Um, it just wouldn't be taught that explicitly and there wouldn't be um, chances to practice the pattern in the same way in all those multiple ways. And it also um, would lack the decodable text. So decodable text is really important for students who are trying to trust that they are learning this phonics pattern and that they are understanding the pattern. They need a chance to practice with text that has those words and with more than one word in three paragraphs that fit that pattern. They need lots of opportunities and you saw in that decodable text where it was highlighted, there were a lot, a lot of um, words that followed the pattern we were studying. And that's because you want that in decodable text. But the other highlight of decodable text is it does not have words that haven't been already, the pattern hasn't been taught. So I'll, I'll stop with that and see if some of the other panelists want to jump in on that. I think you hit that right on the, the nail on the head. That was a perfect answer. Thank you. Can I add something in? Go ahead, Becky. Talk about getting a school to make that shift is look at data because we know that you know, the majority of our kids do need that systematic, um, very explicit approach. And so if you're looking at your data and close to 90% of your kids are not passing and doing well, then you know you've got some instructional issues because the majority of our kids, 90% of our kids should be able to read at proficient levels. So if your school is down in the 40s and the 50s and even in the 60s, there's some work to do there. Wonderful answer. That's very true. Data doesn't lie. All right, here's the next one. Can you discuss why phonological awareness is necessary to be successful with phonics? Susan, do you want to take that one? I'll, I'll start and then that, somebody will jump in after me too because there's so much we can say on this particular mm -hmm. topic. It's a huge topic. It's so important. Um, there's one thing to know, which has uh, many students who are dyslexic have as a root underlying cause of their reading difficulty, a phonological processing um, deficit. So understanding that, that phonological processing is one of the things that is so hard for students to do who are dyslexic. So um, it's, it's one of the hallmark core core reasons that they end up having trouble learning to read. Um, phonological awareness is a building block that is essential for learning to read the letters and connecting the letters and the sounds. So we, hear, we learn words first, but we have to be able to be aware of the sounds in the words to be able to align letters to those sounds. So I'll stop for a minute and see if either of the other panelists want to chime in on that one. I'm all about that phonological awareness. They need to be able to hear those sounds in order to, to blend and segment for decoding and encoding. So I, I think it is essential that we make sure students have, have that. And you can kind of co-teach co it at the same time as well, but we wanna make sure that, that phonological awareness piece is solid. I would just add, uh, if you're teaching older students and they mispronounce words, I often would have students that would say, can I go to the library? And they're missing that sound. Or if you look at their, their writing and in the words they're spelling, they're missing sounds. They might spell the pattern wrong, but complete sounds are missing. That's a really big clue that you need to do some further looking at your students. So just look at their spelling. Are all the sounds there? Good question. Good answer. Thank you. Okay, we have this one. Any thoughts on how to spread the word about dyslexia and the importance of structured literacy and the need for teacher education and training? So I think spreading the word about dyslexia is so critical and having now been, you know, having my son um, 20 plus years ago be discovered to be dyslexic, I can tell you that it was really difficult. Dyslexia was not only not understood and not known, but it was a bad word. And in schools, they weren't allowed in a diagnostic evaluation to use the D word. That still exists, I know, some places, but boy, has it changed the last five to 10 years. Things are so much better than they were, they were at one point. Um, 
there are a lot of reasons and we have a lot of people to thank for that, not the least of which is some very vocal parents who have actually made a huge difference in their, because they've advocated so hard to raise awareness about dyslexia. So I think spreading the word is very important and whether this person who's asking this question is a parent or an educator, there are things you can do. Joining and being active in IDA, I'm telling you, is very important. And I was very active in IDA and learned so much to help my own child um, in the early years, for sure. Um, and there is a need for teacher training and education. And the laws that have been passed, the dyslexia laws around the country in all of the states, nearly all, I think just about every state now has passed one, have done a tremendous amount to raise awareness. And I imagine that Becky um, or Misty can talk a little bit more about the state law in Arizona, which I know exists and has probably um, will help to bring and spread the word, bring, bring education and spread the word. So um, I know that Arizona has its dyslexia law, and I saw somewhere where the ADE um, dyslexia person was on this webinar. I wish we could tune into her and, and um, have her uh, join us, but I don't know what's happening with COVID and you know how, how that's being um, rolled out. But I will say from a teacher point of view, when I realized what I didn't get at the university, and as I work with students at the university, and they realize, oh my, I didn't get any of this. I didn't know this. I've been a teacher for 10 years. Look at all these kids I've, ta I've taught and I could have done such a better job. Um, one thing I was told is write to the dean of your uni university, write to the dean where you went to school and express your feelings about not getting this science of reading and this structured literacy and let them know. Uh, how it impacted you as a student of that particular university. So that's one thing we as individuals can do right now is communicate with the university we went to. I really do think that's key because as an educator with a master's degree and a reading endorsement along with that, I didn't receive instruction for this. And there's many educators out there. So I, I really do believe that that is key is that we need um, to get that where teachers are developing this skill when they are learning how to be a teacher. So very important. And I do also suggest utilizing IDA. We have trainings and we want to go out. We want to spread our word. This, this is our mission is to um, help parents, to help students, to help teachers. So please utilize us. And, and we have trainings that we like to go out. And then this is going to be recorded and it will be on our website. So feel free to um, tap into this with your, your staff, your teachers, your parents, or others that you know are struggling with dyslexia. We are here for you. Okay. If comparing a student whose instruction has been based on structured literacy to a student who has received another literacy approach, what might be the difference in progression you may see in the beginning and then long term? That's a great question. Thank you, Brittany, for asking that. Um, I think that's what is very interesting is that students taught with a more uh, a less explicit approach. Sometimes at the beginning, look like they're reading. Um, they can fool you because they are memorizing a lot of words and they have a really good memory and they have a really great oral language and they're just immediately picking up on, oh, that's, that's that word, that's that word. And so they might look like they're doing just great. Later on is when it becomes such a huge problem, okay? So when the text is, sh is when they're asked to read as part of their um, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, science, social studies, and much more diverse text that requires them to actually figure out how to recognize a word they don't know, that is where the difference is very evident. Students who have not been taught how to explicitly make sense of text and decode the text using that left to right letter sound correspondence that we're teaching, those, um, those skills when not present, will, their, their reading will start to fall apart because they've gone past the words they were able to memorize, past the words that they just could figure out really easily. So that's a very, clear way to see that difference between students who are taught to read, uh, to decode, and read explicitly going letter by letter with those students who really were memorizing or being cued 
to, to look at the wrong cues. So I just want to throw in one more thing. Um, there has been in the past an awful lot of queuing. Um, by that, what it's sometimes referred to as the three queuing system or other um, names. And by that, what I mean is if a student is told, oh, you don't know that word, look at the first letter. Look around it and see what makes sense. Guess. Okay, guessing or looking at the wrong things through those types of cues leads to the the wrong process happening. You, what we need is we need the student to look at every single letter, go left to right. You have to process the text left to right multiple times until your brain finally gets the connection and then it does become a word you have learned. In fact, it is a word you've learned, but you haven't learned it the wrong way, you've learned it the right way and you will retain that ability and you could figure out new words then. And I think that three queuing system is something that's been embedded in our teachers' brains to teach and reinforce. And so it's kind of breaking the old habit and, and learning that we really want kids to, to look at all of the parts of the, of the work. So that's very important. I had um, a question here that says, can you talk about the importance of decoding books in kindergarten and first grade for most students? And I, I mean, I just think that it's really important that we have decodables for students so that they can practice whatever it is that they're learning and they can have that application piece um, to carry over in that more complex text. We need to provide them opportunity for that. Does anybody else have a, a comment in regards to the decodable text? Totally agree. Exactly what you said. If, you know, without decodable text, your students are not getting enough chance to practice the pattern that you just taught that you just taught them. And also, without decodable text, they're getting words that are way above what they've been taught, and that makes them feel that they're supposed to know how to read that word, and that leads to guessing, which is what we don't want them to do. Exactly, no guessing allowed. Um, this is a good one from Catherine. What are your thoughts on how schools might treat the instruction of sight words and the approach that sight words fall only under the realm of high frequency sight words, rather irregular or regular? So what are your thoughts on how schools might treat the instruction of sight words? Do you want me to take that? Go for it, I, Becky. I can do it. I, uh, in, a good, in a good program, um, we learn decoding first. We learn to decode words. It's a harder skill than memorizing. So we don't want to introduce that memorizing piece too soon. We want students to decode, to learn to decode. And it's important that a student can only memorize so many words. So we don't want them memorizing words that are regular and that can be sounded, that they can sound out. Um, uh, so um, differentiating between regular words and irregular words for students and then teaching them that both of these words can become sight words if, if we learn them. You know, there's certain words that have to be um, memorized. There are heart words and because the pattern is irregular, but differentiating and helping teachers understand the difference between them and then why we wanted to push decoding first rather than just memorizing words. Susan, do you have anything? Oh, absolutely. Everything you said is absolutely true. Uh, I think it's very interesting that the term sight word is so, um, has so many different meanings. So we used to say sight word to mean a word you had to memorize and know by sight. Now the researchers are pointing out something very intriguing, which it took me kind of a while to process this new information as it started, I started to read more in the last five to 10 years about this topic. And Actually, what we do want is we want a word to become a sight word, if you want to think about it that way, a word that you recognize instantly and effortlessly without decoding it. So the goal is for lots of words to become sight words. It's a matter of how you get there. And actually, fluent reading occurs when a student um, knows nearly all of the words, recognizes nearly all of the words instantly and effortlessly without decoding them. So you might think to yourself, oh, well, then I'm supposed to have them memorize all the words. No, it's very intriguing because the end goal is that you have a big, huge sight vocabulary. But there's two ways there. Well, I'm sure there's lots of ways there, but we'll talk about two as a contrast. One is to try to memorize them, and the other is to try to decode them until you learn them. And most words can be decoded. Some, very few, um, really need to be 
strictly learn because S-A-I-D is not spelled the way we pronounce it. S-A-I-D is definitely not, uh, doesn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sound we're saying and the way that it's typically spelled. But we want um, students to really be taught to, to look at those letters, stay with the letters, and by looking and processing the letters left to right, that word, in fact, after what they say on average is four exposures. Now that's for normally progressing students. And you may be sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, you know, my son or daughter who is dyslexic or the students I work with who are dyslexic, they never learn words with four exposures. And that's true. They don't um, because it's very, very difficult for those to make those for them to make that phoneme or sound to letter correspondence. That's what is hanging them up. So it does take more exposures. It takes a lot more exposures, but it takes good explicit instruction to go along with those exposures. That's why structured literacy is so important for kids who are dyslexic. Wow, and it's just that passion that we have um, in regards to this, because I, you know, I've been doing some trainings and that's been a huge question about the sight words and the high frequency and trick words and, and irregular words is, you know, how, when do we start and why do we start so early or why do we start so late and what's the recommendation? And, and I, I piggyback on Becky and say, we really want to teach students to be able to decode first before we get to that memorization, because it, a memorization is such an, an easy strategy at a young age to be able to compensate for their lack of being able to decode. And we really want them to, to work the word. We want them to work hard to be able to decode it instead of relying on that memorization. So holding off on, on teaching them that strategy for a while, I think is very beneficial to the students. So um, I have another question about um, what is the difference between a diagnostic assessment and a universal screener? And why do we need both? Becky's good at this one. Do you want to take this one, Becky? Yes. <laughs> um, um, the universal screener everyone gets, and it sends up the red flag. Ooh, I need some help here. So um, it, it just tells us who's having a problem. And the diagnostic test we give to those, all of those yellow and red students, we give them the diagnostic test and that tells us what they need. So the universal screener tells us who needs help. The diagnostic test tells us what they need. And you have to have that diagnostic test or you're just, you're just like shooting in the dark and you're putting kids together who have different skill needs and it's not a very effective small group um, intervention. So we just remember the universal screener tells you who needs help and the diagnostic uh, screener tells you what they need, what to do for them. So I'm going to put in a little plug here for um, Dr. Hall and this amazing book <laughs> that she has authored. Um, you can tell I love this book. I have it highlighted. I have it tabbed. This is a highly utilized book. And it's um, the 10 success factors for literacy intervention. And there is a segment in there about the difference between diagnostic and universal um, screeners. It, the book is such an easy read. And I love the analogies that she uses in, in there. So if that's something that interests you, there you go. So thank you for, for that. Let's see. Um, oh, okay. I love this topic, spelling test. So let's have a discussion about spelling test. Oh, I could go on for days about this one. <laughs> well, Please, your go first. You go first. <laughs> Um, you know, I say gone are the days of Friday spelling test. We, we just are not wanting the um, memorization piece to be there. We don't want students to um, sit and spit and then forget, forget about it. Uh, we really want to analyze if students have an understanding of the phonetic concept, not one single word. We want to be able to um, give the students the ability to unlock a multitude of words versus memorizing one word that we know later in context they won't be able to spell correctly. So that's a hard shift for parents is we're not doing Friday spelling test anymore and that we're really wanting to assess whether the student can use the syllable type or use the phonetic um, structure that we're teaching the students, you know, uh, to spell a multitude of words versus one word. And I would and add, I would add even, you know, you, if you're teaching this pattern this week, 
you still have to wait, you still have to know that students have learned. You have to test it sometime. So what I would always say, it's a pattern test. It's not a spelling test. Mm -hmm. It's a pattern test. We're testing the pattern. So, you know, even if parents still want a spelling test, you can give parents what they want, a spelling test. But in your classroom, it's the pattern. And so all of your words for that week are are about that pattern rather than random words from the story. You know, uh, research tells us if you're just doing random words from the story, then you might as well not do it. Just what Misty said, it, it's pointless. It's waste of time and energy and effort. But if you're pairing your words around a pattern and you're, you're trying to gather some data to have they mastered this pattern, that's a whole different ball game. So. Absolutely. And so I, that's going to piggyback on Anne's um, question that she has here is that uh, her son, he, he lacks some decoding skills and that she wants um, some information on how she can get her son to, the help that he needs to maximize his resource time in regards to spelling. Um, it, it's hard because we, we really want those teachers to have that understanding of structured literacy and, and really focus on those components. And if they're you know, giving a, a list of them for words for them to memorize, then it's apparent that the teacher does, does not have the knowledge to do better. So I, it is a sensitive topic, but I would address you know, and I can't really say with, you know, legally all that, but, um, you know, maybe just having discussions around the IEP and how it's written and does it include the um, syllable type instruction and maybe go from there. That would be my, my um, advice would be to take a look at the IEP and how it's written. Okay. Yeah, so you might be able to bring in the IDA um, structured literacy position paper. Um, I think that that taking that into schools and saying, or taking that into your IEP meeting and saying, you know, this is what the International Dyslexia Association defines as the approach that students who are dyslexic and, and who have reading disabilities or difficulties, this is the kind of instruction they should have. And so can you explain to me in his IEP where he's getting this instruction and how does that match with 20 weekly spelling words that he's supposed to memorize so i would take in my authorities you know with the documents that you take to school and hopefully i think that the only solution really is that teachers get better training and until that happens and we don't we've got to push for that teacher training is is really uh the path to getting better results for kids but it's very hard to get that train, the right kind of training to happen in schools. And that's, that's what I find when I work with special ed teachers. They want kids to be successful. They want to do the right things, but they don't know because they weren't taught. And so it's a learning process for classroom teachers, special ed teachers, parents. It's a learning process for everyone, um, unfortunately. Um, but oftentimes, you know, teachers want to do what's best. They just don't know. Yeah, that is so true. And Becky, Misty, and I all spend a lot of our time t training teachers and talking to teachers and have over our careers. And um, teachers want to do what's right for kids. But I cannot tell you in my career how many teachers, when I have trained, when I have been conducted professional development sessions, have literally said to me, why did no one teach me this? Over and over again, some variation of that, sometimes, sometimes quite emotional. I could have helped a lot of kids. Why didn't I have this? Like, why am I learning this now in my 25th year of teaching? What is going on? You know, teachers are uh, being asked to do something without proper training, especially as teachers who are special education teachers. And I've got to tell you, in my experience in schools, special education teachers are sometimes the least trained in this. So one of the things you have in Arizona is you have um, TRE teaching reading effectively and your school should should get TRE training. Um, it's the first place to start. It doesn't cost, I don't know, does it cost anything, Becky, for them to get it, TRE? It, it was $85 for five days. It's a great oh. deal. Yeah. 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 So if I were a parent um, or an educator listening to this and thinking, well, how can I get you know, my group of teachers trained, the very first thing I would do is go to the principal and push for TRE, teaching, reading, effectively training. Why can't we bring that into our school? It's not very costly. It's supposed to be great. You know, um, you have such a fabulous resource in Arizona compared to other states where it's not available. 
in that way at that cost. And there are a lot of trainers already trained around the state that can come in and do the TRE training. Or if you're a big district, my understanding is you can get, you can go through, you can have someone go through train the trainer and get mentored and then turn around and retrain your teachers, um, which I know Becky knows a ton about. Did it for a long time? Yeah, that's the TOT model. And that's how we can get our teachers trained. And I want to piggyback on that and not just say teachers, but our administrators also need to have this training and they need to be aware um, so that they can support their teachers in this. I think that that is very huge. TOT for the TRE. Yep. Becky the Amazing trained me, so. <laughs> okay, I do like this question here from Tamara. It says, um, structured literacy encompasses all five components of reading. Thus far, you have addressed phonological awareness, phonics, and fluency. Please share the best approach for teaching vocabulary and comprehension. Want me to take it? Yeah, go for it. Go I was for reading, it. Becky. I knew this was kind of your alley. <laughs> this one's perfect for her. Yeah, she well, loves this one. Um, vocabulary really comes in when we are we transition from syllables to morphology, and that's very much in our Arizona standards in the um, reading foundation standards. And morphology actually starts down in second grade when we teach pre and and con and all of those pieces. So the morphology piece is there. Um, sometimes fourth, fifth, and sixth fourth and fifth grade forget to do it um, because it's a foundation skill but it is there if you look at standard three in the reading foundations you will see a strong morphology uh, uh, strand in there and it goes through fifth grade so vocabulary is very much addressed in our standard comprehension on the other hand and i've been reading research and you know when we talk about structured literacy we would never expect a child to just get the word. We want to break down the word and we want them to sound out the word and understand all aspects of the word. Well, when we look at comprehension, we kind of need to break it down as well. We can't just hand students a paragraph and say, absorb the paragraph and read it and understand it. And I think that's sometimes some of the strategies that we use. But if you look at really the structured literacy approach, you would want to take that paragraph and break it down into sentences. And then we break those sentences down. And that means we have to know what a prepositional phrase is. We have to know what those meaningful, um, uh, meaningful word noun noun phrases are. And noun phrases are, you know, loaded words. They trip kids up. Hazy October morning. Misty will remember that one. Hazy October morning. For you and I, that's easy. But for kiddos who who are struggling with the language, that's a that's a pretty that's a lot of learning there and and um, a lot to get through. So breaking down the words, and that's why we have in our language strand the parts of speech. And parts of speech are supposed to be mastered by the end of third grade, so that students can use their knowledge of the parts of speech to be able to apply them and break sentences down. Who did it? What did they do? And um, you know that's the the noun and the verb. And you know the description. When did they do it? How did they do it? So um, pulling in that grammar, semantic, syntax piece is very important to comprehension. And we don't always do that. That's the piece that's been forgotten when we look at traditional um, comprehension instruction. So that's a piece that to to really think about. If you apply the strategies of structured literacy to comprehension, we have to break those sentences and paragraphs down for kids and teach them to do that. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> we know that's one of our favorite topics. And, and I wanna say vocabulary instruction should be happening throughout the day. You know, we have students with limited language and it really affects comprehension. So um, you can take the simplest word like check, the word check. You think about that and if a student is reading the word check in context, they may take a whole different internalization of that sentence because their understanding of the word may be di very different than the way it's intended in the sentence. So check could mean to write a check, almost obsolete right now, <laughs> um, or like to um, check the work or put a check mark on something. I was once in a second grade classroom and we were talking about uh, the word check and I had 
a student say, well, when I go to the airport, I check in my luggage. And then I had another student say, well, I play checkers with my grandfather and I check mate. So there's, you know, they bring a lot to the table, but that discussion about one word with multiple meanings is very huge and how it can impact those students that have limited language. So vocabulary, we want to address it throughout the day, even with the most simplest basic words. Uh, comprehension too, I think, you know, that by doing that, it's really going to improve, improve those pieces. Okay, so I think we pretty much are um, about ready to wrap up. I want to see, I didn't get a chance to read this one last one because I started talking. So let me look at this real quick. Okay, let's see if I may, adding on to Becky's comments on comprehension, structured literacy research, the more sight words in a reader's lexicon, the better they can read with fluency and build content knowledge about lots of different topics. We know that more knowledge builds comprehension. 100% agreement with everything that was shared. So you guys were a great audience today and I am super happy that um, you took an hour out of your busy Saturday to join us. So what we would like to do now is I'm going to go ahead and share my thank you slides that we've got here. And we are going to do a couple of little games for some prizes, yay! So we wanna appreciate you for spending some time with us. So here's what we're going to do. The third person, listen carefully, to type their name, their full name that is, in the Q&A wins an IDA membership. And if you're the winner and you already have an IDA membership, I think we're gonna give you a shirt. So third person in the Q&A. It's Ann Kennedy. Woohoo! Thank you, Susan, for pointing that out. Okay, and Mary, I hope you got that name down. Here we go. And I'm gonna need Becky and Susan to watch the Q&A. The first person to answer this question correctly in the Q&A wins a Starbucks gift card. Woohoo! For the coffee chat. Ready? Here goes your question. It's going to be a difficult one, so I hope you guys got this. Ready? What are the principles that guide how structured literacy elements are taught? I'll read it again. What are the principles that guide how structured literacy elements are taught? It could be written in three or four different things. We've got Catherine a winner. Norwood. We've got a winner. Oh, Catherine, was Catherine it Catherine Norwood? Catherine Norwood. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? Right. Oh, no, Catherine. She's got it. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Okay. And then here we go. The fourth person who does this, I'm going to wait till the end gets a IDA Arizona branch t-shirt. And this is the fourth person who types their full name into the Q&A. The fourth person. It, it looks like it's Ann Kennedy again. <laughs> Ann Kennedy's a fast typist. Look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the fourth one, two, three. Yeah, Ann <laughs> Kennedy again. You are fast, Anne. <laughs> well, I really want to thank you guys for joining us today. And I want to give a special thanks to Becky and Susan. This was a lot of fun. And I hope that the parents and the educators that joined us are able to take something back. Um, I think that every time we get together and we share our gift of knowledge that somebody walks away with something. And it's that common passion that we have that in the end, we want all of our students to have that ability to, to be successful in reading because we know it impacts their daily life. So we thank you for your time and for your dedication for the cause of, um, you know, at the end, every child should be able to read. And um, the last thing I wanna do is um, just let you know, we are going to continue our coffee chats the next one coming up is um, Wingers, Dr. Wingers, and that's going to be about anxiety and dyslexia. So um, keep an eye out for that. We plan to do one each month, about six total. So please join us because I think it is a great opportunity and it's just a small amount of time. So it's not like we're taking a whole day um, out of your time. So thank you very much. And I appreciate so much your time and have a great weekend. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Misty, for, for inviting us and also Mary behind the scenes who's been um, helping out as well. Mary and Rachel. So those and are Rachel. Arizona IDA branch uh, members and, and they were very important and essential in planning this. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.